Everyone, please stand and join in singing the national anthem led by Judy Fast. Please remain standing for the Pledge of Allegiance and the invocation. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare the bombs bursting in air gave through the night that our flag was still there oh say does that star-spangled banner yet wave for the land of the free and the I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Kansas Elk Association third vice president, Ken Schaefer from Hoxie Lodge, number 2415, will lead us in prayer. Almighty God, in this hour of patriotic observance of the birthday of the American flag, we ask you to bless our flag and the people of these United States. For all that our flag represents, both at home and abroad, we thank thee, and that through all, all our history as a nation, it has been an ensign of freedom, liberty, and opportunity. And through the years to come, may this flag wave as a banner of liberty, freedom, and enlightenment. May this service bring to each of us a sense of loyalty to our country and enable us to be better patriots, truer citizens, and more loyal Americans to thy glory and to the honor of this great nation. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. The welcome speech will be given by Rudy Draper. Mayor of Pittsburgh. Thank you. First off, I'd like to uh, thank everybody for attending today here in Pittsburgh, Kansas, on the campus of PSU, uh, here at our Veterans Memorial Theater. Uh, I wasn't sure what I needed to say today, so I'm going to go ahead and, uh, besides welcoming you, I'm going to go ahead and say what I think the, uh, the flag means to me. Uh, you know, this is a special occasion in, in recognition for our American flag. You know, we, we need to celebrate our nation's greatest symbol, which is our flag. Our flag symbolizes freedom, dignity, and our courage. It has been through with us through good times and bad and still remains strong with us through perseverance and stands ready for any task. Me personally, the American flag, uh, represents three core values 
Uh, I also, I took these from the Marine Corps. I spent eight years in the Marine Corps and they, these are the Marine values. It's honor, courage, and commitment. And when I look at the flag, I see honor because, uh, you know, we represent the world with our com compassion and our constant sturdiness. Courage, that has been carried with us in all our wars and never falters. Commitment, we are committed to freedom for all at whatever the cost. Uh, those are a few of the, the reasons why we're here today. I believe that the flag is very important and that we should always be trustworthy in it. Uh, at any time, our freedom can be threatened, but rest assured, when you see the American flying high, the threats and the test to, to take our freedom are just that. We will never rest to keep our freedom flying high in every city, town, and across our nation. Thank you and enjoy the ceremony. Members and guests, it is my privilege to introduce you, introduce to you Special Deputy Grand Exalted Ritter Walt Lithicum from Gooden Lodge, 1528, representing past Grand Exalted Ritter and Kansas sponsor, James McQuillan. Thank you, Tony. Uh, I don't have much to do since Jim couldn't make it. Why, uh, I don't have anybody to introduce. But I would like to welcome the Elks that made it here it, to this great facility for our Flag Day service. Uh, have a fantastic day. Thank you. Oh, beautiful for spacious skies, for amber waves of grain, for purple mountain majesties above the fruited plain. America, America, God shed his grace on thee and crown thy good with brotherhood from sea to shining sea. Oh, beautiful for pilgrim feet whose stern in passion stress, a thoroughfare of freedom beat across the wilderness. America, America, God mend thine every flaw. Confirm thy soul in self-control, thy liberty in Members, guests, the purpose of this service is to honor our country's flag, to celebrate the anniversary of its birth, and to recall the achievements attained beneath its folds. It is quite appropriate that such a service should be held by the Order of Elks, an organization distinctively American, intensely patriotic, and without counterpart. The fraternal aims of the Benevolent and Protective Order of Elks are to inculcate the principles of charity, justice, brotherly love, and fidelity, to, to promote the welfare and happiness of mankind, to uphold our country and its laws, and to quicken the spirit of American patriotism. To Elks, the significance of the American flag serves as, as an emblem of charity and justice for all, and as a symbol of brotherly love and fidelity. Charity, justice, brotherly love, and fidelity are the cardinal, cardinal principles of the Order of Elks, and they are exemplified in all our services. By them we teach love of country, our countrymen, and loyalty to our American way of life. To be an elk, is to be an American citizen who lives for his country and is ready to die for it. That we may better understand the meaning of our flag, 
I call upon Kansas Elks Association First Vice, First Vice President Carl Billings from Garden City Lodge number 404 for the history of the flags. <clears throat> the flag, it's history. Pilgrimage is as old as a human race. The carrying of banners has been a custom among all people of all ages. <clears throat> These banners usually contain some concept of the life of go government of those who fashion them. The evolution of the American flag marks a progression of the government of the American people. From the founding of Jamestown in Virginia in, in 1607 until 1775, the flag of England was a flag of the peoples of America. In 1775, the pine tree flag was adopted for all colonial vessels, and this was a banner carried by the Continental Forces in the Battle of Bunker, Bunker Hill. The southern colonies from 1776 to 1777 used the snake flag. <clears throat> In the latter part of 1775, the Continental Congress appointed a committee to consider the question of a single flag for the 13 colonies. That committee recommended a design of 13 alternate stripes of red and white with an Asura field in the upper corner bearing the red cross of St. George and the white cross of St. Andrews. John Paul Jones, the senior lieutenant of the flagship Alfred, hoisted this flag to the masthead of, on December 3rd, 1775. And one month later, it was raised over the headquarters of General George Washington at Cambridge, Massachusetts and compliment as he wrote to the United Colonies. This flag called the Continental Colors and the Grand Union was never carried in the field by the Continental Land Forces, but it was used by the Navy as its exclusive ensign and was the first American flag to receive a salute of honor. A salute of 11 guns from the Fort of Orange in the Dutch West Indies. In response to a general demand for a banner more representative of our country, the Congress on June the 14th, 1777 provided that the flag of the, Uni of the United States be 13 stripes of alternating red and white, and that the Union be 13 stars, white on a blue field, representing a new constellation. It is generally believed that in May or June of 1776, a committee consisting of George Washington Robert Morris and George Ross commissioned Betty Ross, a Philadelphia Quakeress, to make a flag from a rough design they left with her. It is said that she suggested that the stars should have five points rather than six. This starry banner was first flown at Fort Stanwyck, called Fort Schuler, or Fort Schuyler, at that time near the city of Rome, New York, on August 3rd, 1777, and was under fire three days later at the Battle of Oriski, August 6th, 1777, during a British and Indian attack. 
The first official salute to the Stars and Stripes was given on February 14, 1778, when the Ranger, under command of John Paul Jones, was saluted by the French fleet. This flag, then carried by the Ranger, was made by the young woman of Portsmouth, New, New Hampshire, from stripes of their best colored silk dresses and the white wedding gown of a recent bride. It is said that this same ranger's flag was flown by Jones' ship, the Bonhomme Richard, in its thrilling fight of moonlight upon the high seas with the British frigate Serapis when the Serapis struck her colors the immortal fame of John Paul Jones was ensured as the intrepid defender, defender of the youthful republic. The original 13 stars and stripes represented the original 13 colonies. In 1795, two additional stars and stripes were added to represent admission to the Union of Vermont and Kentucky. Under this banner of 15 stars and stripes was fought the war of 1812. It was the sight of it flying over Fort McHenry on September 14, 1814 that inspired Francis Scott Key to, to write what was to become our national anthem, the Star Spangled Banner. Miss Margaret Young, who cut the stars for that per particular banner, subsequently became the mother of Henry Sanderson the Grand Exalted Ruler of the Order of Elks in 1884. The Congress on April 14, 1818 adopted a resolution that on, on and after July 4, 1818, the number of stripes should be 13 and that the blue field should carry one star for each of the 20 states in, in the Union and that a new star should be added for each state thereafter admitted. Since 1818, there has been no change in the flag design except that 28 new stars were added before July 4th, 1912. And this flag of 48 stars flew over the nation for 47 years until just before the Vietnam War. On July 4th, 1959, a star was added for Alaska, our first non-connected state, and a year later, Hawaii, our island state, adds a 50th star. Our present flag, 50 stars and 13 stripes, is accompanied by the prisoner of war missing action flag to recognize the plight and demise of a special group of our armed services those who were prisoners of war and still remain missing in action. The Order of Elks is the first and only fraternal body to require to require formal observance of Flag Day. In July of 1908, the Grand Lodge of this order at Dallas, Texas, provided for the annual nationwide observation of Flag Day on the 14th of June of each year by making it mandatory upon each subordinate lodge of the order. This unique distinction as the or or originator of Flag Day is most becoming to the Order of Elks. This order is distinctly American. Only American citizens are eligible to join, and it has no foreign affiliations. It has linked its destiny with the destiny of our country and to make this flag its symbol of self-dedication to God, to country, and to fellow man. The response to the history of the flags will be presented by Kansas Elk Association Second Vice President Carl Lindsay from Overland Park Lodge, number 2395. The Stars and Stripes flag of the United States of America, the worldwide hope of all who, under God, would be free to live and do His will. 
Upon its folds is written the story of America, the epic of the mightiest and noblest in all history. In the days when people of the old world groveled and object homage to the heresy of the divine right of the kings, a new constellation appeared in the western skies, the stars and stripes symbolizing the divine right of all men to life, liberty, happiness, and peace under endowment by their creator. To what man is given words adequate to tell the story of the building of this nation, the immortal story is written in blood and sweat, in heroic deeds and unremitting toil in the clearing of primeval forests, in the planting of vast prairies where once the coyote and the buffalo roamed. Onward swept the nation, spanning wide rivers, leaping vast mountain ranges, leaving in its path villages and farms, factories and cities, till at last this giant nation stood astride the continent. From the Atlantic to the Pacific, this is the heritage of the people of the United States. It has been repurchased by each succeeding generation and must be rewon again, again, and again until the end of time, lest it too shall pass like the ancient empires of Greece and Rome. The price of liberty is eternal vigilance. What was won at Lexington and Concord and Bunker Hill had to be repurchased at Ticonderoga and Yorktown. What John Paul Jones achieved upon the high seas in the War of Independence had to be repurchased by the Commodore Perry on Lake Erie in the War of 1812. The prestige of Admiral Dewey's victory at Manila Bay in 1898 was re-won by the naval battles in the seas about the far distant islands in the Pacific. After the sneak attacks upon Pearl Harbor and Manila in 1941 had summoned our country to assume its role in World War II, what our tr troops achieved under the Stars and Stripes at Chateau, Theory and Flanders in World War I, their sons were required to repurchase in World War II in the bloody trek across the northern Africa on the beachheads of Europe and in the Battle of the Bulge. The flag of our American boys raised at Iwo Jima was the same flag later raised in the defense of Incheon, Pusan, and Porkchop Hill and far off Korea. Then another generation under the same flag bled to stem the threat of communism in far off Vietnam. This flag then flew over the boys in Operation Desert Storm, again fighting to help maintain freedom. Our young people were again called to carry our flag in the defense of a free world and the actions in Grenada and Panama. Willingly, our brave men and women carried our flag and the honor of the American people into battle in Operation Desert Storm, Afghanistan, and the Operation Iraqi Freedom. The greatest significance of our flag, however, lies in the influence it has in the hearts and the minds of millions of people. It has waved over the unparalleled progress of the nation in developing democratic institutions, scientific and technologically knowledge, education, and culture. It has served as a beacon for millions of poor and oppressed refugees abroad and stands as a promise that the underprivileged will not be forgotten. What is the meaning of the flag of the United States? There can never be a definitive answer to that question. There are people in the world who see it as a symbol of imperialism. Others see it as a destiny of people. But reference to these and similar views of the flag has resolved by Woodrow Wilson when he said, this flag, which we honor and under which we serve, is the emblem of our unity, our power, our thought, and our shape of this nation. It has no other character than that which we give it from generation to generation. The choices are ours. Only love, true love, and our fellow man can create peace and the emblem and the token that love is the stars and stripes, the symbol of American way of life. Our fathers, God to thee, author of liberty, to thee we sing, Long may our land be bright with freedom's holy light. Protect us by thy might, great God, our King. This next song is entitled, This is My Country, but it's not just my country, it's everybody's country, so I'd like you to help me sing it, okay? 
This is my country, land of my birth. This is my country, grandest on earth. I pledge thee my allegiance, America of old. For this is my country to have and to hold. This is my country, land of my choice. This is my country, hear my proud voice. I pledge thee my allegiance, America the bold. For this is my country to have and to hold. Our speaker today is Brigadier General James Abishan, United States Army Reserve, retired. That be you. Well, thank you all. Thank you all very much. Uh, you know, it never fails as we uh, assemble in this place that the train goes by and announces its presence. I've always said that that's why we have either a cannon or a firing squad as a part of official ceremonies here because one of these days we're gonna shoot the train as it goes by. <laughs> this would have been one of those occasions except I just couldn't get the rifle squad kind of oriented quickly enough and he escaped, that train escaped one more time. Thank you very much for being here. The mayor has already welcomed you to Pittsburgh. I'll just add to that by saying, welcome to Pittsburgh State University and to this special place. I wanna do three things quickly uh, this afternoon in my time here at the podium. And, uh, and then at the end, kind of wrap it all together, tie it all together, uh, hopefully so that it all kind of makes sense. First of all, let me tell you about this special place. This was an inspiration of many about almost 20 years ago. So this place was 20 years in the making. It finally reached a point about 2002 when we were able to assemble enough money that we could hire an architect and start the design process. We needed to take that step so that we could show people what it was we intended to build. So that occurred uh, in uh, roughly 2002. We started the fundraising uh, at that time. It took about a year to raise $1.3 million. Construction started then in 2003 and on Memorial Day 2004, we had 4,000 people show up here for the official dedication and ribbon cutting with U.S. Senator Bob Dole as the featured speaker. It was a grand occasion. And my swear, here comes another train. <laughs> Do we have time to take this one out? I don't know. <laughs> we'll just wait until he gets by if that's okay. As soon as I start, he's going to blow that whistle, I know. <laughs> so real quickly, what you're seeing and what you're experiencing here, let me just cover that real quick. As you approached from the parking lot, you approached the entry rampart. 
The entry rampart is noted by the presence of the three flagpoles on which uh, the flags of the state of Kansas, the university, the POW MIA flag, and the flag of the United States of America proudly waves. The entry rampart is also noted by the presence of the official seals of the five military services. From there, you can enter the memorial proper, the place that we're at right now, one of two ways. You can either go to the left or the right, and each way you experience a slightly different experience. Although you come through the entry portal at each end, the entry portal being that place that is a point of transition. It is a point of transition from the outside world, the everyday, oftentimes noisy and fast and hubbub into a place that is hopefully quiet. Certainly it is solemn and respectful because it is here where the service, the duty, service, and sacrifice of our veterans and those serving in uniform are proudly honored. On one end, you encounter a beautiful sculpture called the Secure the Blessings of Liberty, and it is the bald eagle. It is carrying the staff and the flag of the country. Its talons are bared. Its beak is flared. It is ready to attack or defend as necessary to defend this nation. If you come the other way, you experience a different sculpture, and that is a sculpture entitled Peace and Tranquility. That sculpture is noted by a globe of the, of the world being encircled by doves of peace, and the dove at the apex is carrying a laurel leaf symbols of peace and tranquility. That is the desired state of affairs. That is what we all seek and, and treasure. But we will go to no length to ensure that that's the case, and that's why we're always ready. That's why we've had to fight the wars and conflicts that we've had to fight over the period of our existence as a nation. You enter in here, and the first thing you see is the one-half scale replica of the Vietnam Wall. On that wall are the names of 58,228 sons and daughters of America who lost their lives in Vietnam. Now that wall is in the current state of repair and eventual transition into permanent granite with engraved names, vice what we have now. What we have now just cannot endure the weather, the 365 days of sun and snow and all manner of things during the course of the year, it deteriorates pretty quickly. So we're gonna change all of that over the next uh, several months to something more permanent. You come to on in here and you see the reflecting pool. You'll notice that in the reflecting pool, there is a hole in the middle. There is something incomplete about that, something missing. Indeed, symbolic of the fact that we currently have some 80,000, 80,000 sons and daughters of the nation that are still missing. Their remains never <laughs> discovered, recovered, identified, and returned to their nation and to their families. About 70,000 of those are from World War II, nearly equally divided between the European theater and the Pacific theater. There are about 8,000 of that 80 that are still in Korea, somewhere on the Korean Peninsula from the Korean War. Never found, identified, and returned. From Vietnam, the number is still about 1,800 or so. 
there is about 200 or so that are still missing from the Cold War. We thought the Cold War was not a shooting war, didn't we? That's what we believe. Well, it was not because we lost about 200 of the nation's finest during that period of time. Various shoot downs and other incidents. You add it all up, it's nearly 80,000. So that hole in that reflecting pool is respective and reminiscent of that. In the face of the pool is a gigantic arch and on that arch contains the founding statement on which this memorial is built. And it says, as you can read, Pittsburgh State University honors our sons and daughters who answered the call of the nation. We are ever grateful for their many sacrifices in peace and war so that freedom would prevail. You notice how the concept of freedom intertwines through all of this. The concept of duty, service, and sacrifice intertwines through all of this. Indeed, that's what this is all about. And then at the apex of the arch, an eternal flame intended to light the way in daylight and in darkness, showing the way that our 80,000 still missing can find their way home. We hope and pray someday that that is true. And then flanking the arch are quotations, one from Abraham Lincoln, one from Daniel Webster, and one from Shakespeare. Now the chairs kind of mask that, uh, that you kind of, you can't read it from where you are. But as we finish here, if you get a chance, you might get a little closer and read those three quotations. Before you is the plaza that contains many of the engraved memorial pavers. In total, both here and up on top, there's a total of 3,049 engraved memorial pavers. These represent those who have served this nation in uniform. Some have passed on, some are still living. This place is for both or either or all of that. If any of you have an interest in securing an engraved paver for yourself, if you're a veteran, or a loved one, then as you leave the ceremony, up at the top, there's an information rack where you can pull an information sheet that has all the information you need about securing an engraved paver. We lay those once a year. They are laid uh, and unveiled officially as a part of the Veterans Day ceremony held right here. So uh, the deadline for the next round of pavers will be in early September. If that's an interest to you, uh, certainly uh, you're more than welcome to participate. Second thing, Flag Day. Tomorrow is the official day and we've heard already so much about the origin of the flag. We've heard a personal story about the importance and what it means personally to a soldier, uh, an ex-Marine, currently a member of the United States Army, Kansas National Guard. He didn't say that, but he's currently a soldier. You might tell that from his haircut. <laughs> Doesn't it look good? <laughs> But you've heard the history of the flag, and you know of its origins, you know of when it was first flown, you know who is attributed to making the first one. You've heard about the role of George Washington as the commander of the Continental Army and the first use of the flag. You've heard about how it evolved over the, over the years You've heard about how it reached the point it is now with 13 stars and stripes with a field of 50 stars. The colors red, white, and blue is what we call that. So today the flag consists of the 13 horizontal stripes and seven red al al alternating um, uh, red stripes. 
The stripes represent the 13 original colonies, and uh, then there's the, the field of 50 stars representing the various states of the Union. Should we ever add an additional state to our Union in the future, then the flag will get changed again at that point. And all of this represents hardiness and valor, purity and innocence, and vigilance, perseverance, and justice all of those things and more. That's what that flag is all about. You know, as a part of opening this ceremony, we all recited the Pledge of Allegiance, and how many times will we have done just that? And the Pledge of Allegiance kind of becomes rote. It's automatic. We learn it at an early age. We recite it countless times during our lifetimes. I just ask you to pause some time for a moment and ponder the meaning of each of those words. Now, I'm not going to go through that, but I would just tell you that the pledge was first was written in 1892 by a Baptist minister. He wrote the original pledge, and the original pledge read as follows. I pledge allegiance to my flag and the republic for which it stands, one nation indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Later that uh, same year, there were 12 million schoolchildren who recited that Pledge of Allegiance at the same time, all across the nation, commemorating the 400th anniversary of the arrival of Columbus. Then in June 1923, the first National Flag Conference, led by the American Legion and Daughters of the American Revolution, changed the words to the, to, uh, the pledge and, in, and inserted the word, my flag, and the flag of the United States of America. They inserted those words to that original pledge. And then in 1954, the United States Congress added the words under God to the pledge. So all of that is an important part of who we are. It is an important part of us as Americans. The pledge guides us as a nation in that we, in what we desire to be, what we strive to be, and what we must be. The nation was conceived in high purpose. Its character was strengthened by our forefathers. Now that task is entrusted to us. Now it's our responsibility. With the enduring faith in these principles and resoluteness of purpose, let us unite as Americans to continue the work. And may it be proclaimed in this and future generations that truly we are a nation with liberty and justice for all. Now thirdly, I should note, since I'm an Army guy, that in addition to tomorrow, being the official flag day, June 14th. It is also the birth of the United States Army. Let me talk briefly about the United States Army, since it also has a birthday tomorrow. Tomorrow marks the 234th anniversary of the United States Army. Some may at some point at that day tomorrow, be in the presence of an army flag, which proudly bears the streamers representing 178 campaigns, officially recognized campaigns. These are deployments, conflicts, situations that the army has been involved with throughout. And if you look at the ribbons worn by veterans, you can also see the uh, similar thing worn on the chest of a veteran 
which would symbolize and depict their service during their particular portion of time when those 178 were earned by the United States Army. They're miniature counterparts to the streamers. They reflect our military history as it evolved. Indeed, the history of the United States Army is the history of the nation. It is the history of the nation. Sixteen of these streamers are for the Revolutionary War, six for the War of 1812, ten for the Mexican War, 25 for the Civil War, 14 for the Indian Wars, three for the Spanish-American War, 11 for the Philippine Insurrection, 13 for World War I, 38 for World War II, 10 for Korea, 17 for Vietnam, and 15 for expeditionary combat outside the framework of those major wars that I just mentioned. Interestingly, of the 15 streamers awarded for this kind of miscellaneous expeditionary category of combat, nine of those events have occurred since the end of the Cold War in 1989. The history of the United States Army is the history of America. I would just ask you, why is all this important? Why do we even bother with noting Flag Day? Why do we even note that tomorrow is the history or the, the anniversary of the United States Army? Why even say 234 years the Army's been around? which is about the same period of time the country has been around. Why? Why cite the Pledge of Allegiance? Why? I would submit to you that there is a fundamental reason that we do that, that we do what we do. And I would submit to you the answer goes back to the Declaration of Independence. That occurred roughly 233 years ago. And the 56 signers of that document, we should not forget what they did to get us all started down this path that we have enjoyed for over two centuries as a country. Have you ever wondered what happened to the 56 men who signed the Declaration of Independence? Let me tell you what happened to those 56. They put it all on the line, given the circumstances. They knew exactly what they were doing, and they knew exactly what was at stake. But they did it anyway. Five of the 56 signers were actually captured by the British as traitors and tortured until they died. Twelve had their homes ransacked and burned. Two lost their, sir, uh, their sons serving in the war. Another had two sons captured. Nine of the 56 fought and died from wounds or hardships of the Revolutionary War. They signed and they pledged their lives, their fortune, and their sacred honor. What kind of men were these that would do this? Twenty-four were lawyers or jurists, eleven were merchants, nine were farmers and large plantation owners, all men of means, well-educated, but they signed the Declaration of Independence knowing full well that the penalty would be death if they were captured. Carter Braxton of Virginia, a wealthy planter and trader, saw his ship swept, swept from the seas by the British Navy. He sold his home and properties to pay his debts, and he died in rags. Thomas McKean was so hounded by the British that he was forced to move his family almost constantly. He served in the Congress without pay, and his family was kept in hiding. His possessions were taken from him, and poverty was his reward. 
Vandals or soldiers looted the properties of Dillery, Hall, Clymer, Walton, Ginwit, Hayward, Rutledge, and Middleton. At the Battle of Yorkton, Thomas Nelson Jr. Noticed, noted that the British General Cornwallis had taken over the Nelson home for his headquarters. He quietly urged General George Washington to open fire. The home was destroyed. And Nelson died bankrupt. Francis Lewis had his home and properties destroyed. The enemy jailed his wife, and she died within a few months. John Hart was driven from his wife's bedside as she was dying. Their 13 children fled with, for their lives. His field and his gristmill were laid to waste. For more than a year, he lived in forests and caves, returning home to find his wife dead and his children vanished. Some of us take these liberties so much for granted, but we shouldn't, should we? So I ask that you take a few minutes while enjoying the day and silently thank these patriots and those that have followed. It's not much to ask for the price that they have paid. Ladies and gentlemen, I would just close with this uh, final note and observation. And that is to thank the Elks for the patriotic service that they fulfill for the nation, the patriotic service that you provide for your communities, the special opportunities that you provide for the young children, the youngsters in your various communities that they may learn and experience our form of government and what it means to be an American, you do that and you do it well. And for that, you all should be applauded. Thank you very much for what you do. And thank you for much being here. God bless America. Okay, I know you all know these words, so I want to hear more than the last time, okay? God bless America, land that I love. Stand beside her and guide her through the night with the light from above. From the mountains to the prairies, to the oceans white with foam. God bless America, my home, sweet home. God bless America, my home, sweet home. In conclusion of this observance of Flag Day, let us rededicate ourselves to the flag of the United States of America, and may the principles of charity, justice, brotherly love, and fidelity ever increase in each of us. I'd also like to, at this time, to thank the following participants. The Color Guard from Gir Girard American Legion Post 26, the drummer which I believe was from Pitt State University. The gun salute from the VFW Post 1165, Fort Scott. Taps by the Pitt State University Music Department. The flag bearers from Cub Scout Pack 81. Patriotic singer, Judy Fast. Our speakers, Rudy Draper from the city of Pittsburgh and Brigadier General James Abishon. My flag day, chairpersons in committee, Adam Lusker and Homer Cole, and also the members of the Pittsburgh Elks Lodge Number 412, and also a very special thank you to Pittsburgh State University for the use of such a beautiful facility, and also a very, very special thank you to my wife for making sure I got it done. <laughs> And last but not least, I would like to thank 
a special thank you to our men and women of the armed forces for allowing us to have this program by giving us our freedom that they provided for us. Please stand for the benediction by KEA Kansas Elk Association third vice, third vice President Ken Schaefer from Hoxie Lodge and please remain standing for the gun salute and the playing of retreat. Oop, hang on. Our Father, who art in heaven, we ask thy blessings upon this patriotic service. As we gather to pay our respect and tribute to our nation's flag, may the beauty of its silken folds remind us always of the proud history of our country. May it nourish in the hearts of all reverence for what it represents and the memory of those who fought beneath it. May we foster at all times the true spirit of utmost loyalty to our flag. Amen. Amen. Our state flag day service is now concluded. Thank you all for attending. And uh, Homer, do you have anything you'd like to say? I just want to thank everybody for having the honor of having this here. And please, if you would, uh, let's take our trash out. And thank you all very much. You're all welcome to the Elks. Oh, yeah. The Elks Lodge. Everybody's welcome out to the Elks Lodge.